Okay. Call the meeting to order. Good evening. The governor of the state of Illinois has declared a gubernatorial disaster proclamation in response to the COVID-19 outbreak and all of the city of Elmhurst is covered by the disaster area. In light of the ongoing COVID-19 outbreak, the mayor of the city of Elmhurst has determined that an in-person meeting for the June 21 city council meeting may not be practical or prudent in light of the disaster. All of the aldermen on the city council participating in the June 21 city council meeting, wherever their location shall be verified and determined that they can hear one another and can hear all discussion and testimony during the meeting. Now that I read that, we don't have anyone we do not. participating in Rosa, but it's always good to hear that. All right, Clerk Tamer, uh, would you call the roll, please? Yes. Yeah. Mulliner? Here. Brennan? Here. Varimus? Here. Deuter? Here. Dunn? Here. Hill? Here. Palumsky? Here. Jensen? Here. Toledo? Here. Cahill? Here. Park? Here. Conquest? Here. Estito's absent. Okay. 12 present, one absent, one vacancy. 12 present, one absent, one vacancy. We have a quorum. At this time, I'd ask that you all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, thank you. Uh, on to item two, announcements. Are there any announcements this evening? There being none, we're going to proceed. Alderman Polumsky. Okay, I gotta pull out my information. I Take would like time. to announce that Alderman Jensen and I are hosting our first um, ward meeting, a town hall meeting on Thursday night, seven o'clock. Yep. Okay, seven o'clock at city council chambers. And our um, focus will be the North York development and we will have um, our uh, development or business development coordinator, Aaron Jason there and also city manager Grabowski. So um, we would like to welcome third ward residents, but also it's a, it's a public meeting. So anybody would be welcome to come. Hope to see you, thanks. Thank you, Alderman Plumsky. Any other announcements? We'll move on to item three. Presentations, item 3.1, ComEd Annual Franchise Report, which we seem to do every year. Um, we welcome Cynthia Thomas uh, from ComEd. She is our uh, external affairs manager for the North Region. Welcome, Cynthia. Please proceed. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, everyone. It's so nice to be back. <laughs> Good to see everyone in person. Uh, so again, uh, thank you, Mayor, for allowing me to present uh, a couple slides this evening and welcome uh, aldermen, particularly the ones that I haven't met yet. So we want to come and just kind of do a quick little um, review of what we do for uh, Elmhurst. Again, I'm the external affairs manager. Uh, my role uh, is to support the mayor and his team. Uh, so what that looks like, uh, if there's escalated issues that come through uh, the city, those come to be. Jim and I have a very good relationship, depending on what's going on. Uh, so we do that. Uh, if there are uh, special events, uh, things where we can support the community, we also work together on those things, energy efficiency. Um, let's see what else I want to make sure. We also can do, you know, if there's volunteers needed for different events, we'll also do those things as well. So just want to give you an idea of kind of what is ComEd doing here. And so this is my meet and greet. So I just told you who I am and how we support Elmhurst. A couple quick things I wanted to talk about before we get to the reliability report. Um, and I don't want to forget to mention this regarding the reliability report that we're going to talk about in just a minute. I'm going to do just a quick high level here. But that is an annual report um, that I come to uh, the city every year. And we go over what's going on with reliability in the city, what we did last year in terms of improvements, and then what we plan to do this year. And of course, I answer any, any questions related to that. So that's an annual meeting that we do every year. And it's a wonderful opportunity to come in at least once a year if we don't see each other more than that and talk about it one-on-one, -on -one. okay? 
Uh, for ComEd assistance programs, just want to give a little reminder here. Um, we have home energy assessments. I talked about this the last time I was here. Um, they are free. We come out, we would come out to the, your house, do an assessment, and then you would also get some free things attached to that, depending on what you need. And if you remember that, it was, I kept saying everything was free, free, free. Um, well, of course, due to COVID, we did not, um, uh, we stopped for a period of time, and then we went virtual. Now we have both uh, reiterations of that program available. Uh, if you go to that link, the Home Energy Assessment ComEd link, it will take you to a place where you can schedule either a virtual uh, visit, if people are more comfortable with that, or um, we can come out to the house now, uh, you know, with the proper precautions, we can come out to the house now and do the assessments. Um, I, I have done this uh, in my home, and it's it's pretty wonderful because if you don't have L, if you don't have LEDs, you'll get them. If you have a problem with your aerator on your sink, we'll change it. Uh, if there are uh, different things, um, your thermostat, we have a discount for that. There are different things that homeowners can get and businesses can get based on that assessment. So I encourage you all to please uh, take a look online for that assessment and sign up and just get on the list. Whatever, wherever you fall, I encourage you to do it. And that's gonna save you some energy, save you some money in the long run. So the other two programs I want to mention tonight was residential special hardship. Um, for those who, who need it, uh, there are some folks who struggled, you know, obviously the last year. And this was a program that we've had for some years, and you could get up to $500 towards arrearages for your bill. So you have to go through the LIHEAP agencies to apply, but residential special hardship is funded. And you know, again, if you know someone or you know seniors or military folks who might need some support, I would, again, encourage you to go online and take a look at that. Comet.com slash residential special hardship is the link for that. For the other one is nonprofit special hardship. Now you can get up to $2,000, an organization can get up to $2,000 to support their efforts. Again, applications online, um, we vet those, and then you know we can support those organizations as well. Okay, any questions about that? No? Okay. Don't forget to sign up, guys. Um, the one other thing I'll point to, in the back on the table, I did bring some brochures with. Um, please make sure you take one you know, as you're leaving out. It's related to fraud. I think we've all heard about all the different kinds of fraud that's going on, and we are susceptible as well. Um, we've had our seniors you know, think that you know, we're coming to their door and asking them for their account number. We will never do that. We have it, and we don't come to the door and collect money and things like that. So that bro fraud brochure will give you just some tips um, to just make sure that you know you are indeed speaking with us and the things that we will and won't do. So we want to make sure that residents are aware so that you don't get in a situation that you got to figure out how to get out of. Okay. Okay. So Elmhurst reliability performance. This is um, I'll tell you. Because looking at these numbers, you're like, what in the world is going on up here? So SAFE, that's COMEDS because we love um, acronyms. So it's System Average Frequency Interruption Index. So what that simply means is the average number of interruptions that a customer um, would have in a year. So this is looking at uh, last year's numbers. So we have um, 0.26 was SAFE. That's the average number of outages for Elmhurst. When you look at Katie, Katie is the average number of, uh, is the average length. So of the number of folks who were out, how long were they out? For, let me go back, because I want to make sure I get this right. For 2020, it was 1.27 out, outages per person or per household. That's without the duration, OK? We had the huge August storm, everybody remember that? Horrible situation? Yeah. So anyway, we put our safety up here, and then we put Katie up here. It would have been, uh, nine, it was 901 minutes average, and then that was last year, and that is with the duratio. Without the duratio, we would have been at 56 minutes. This year, year to date, we're at 58 minutes. Let me go back and make sure I got my 2020 right. So we were at 1.27 for 
last year, that is with the duratio. Without duratio, we would have been at 0.67. So we wanted to at least explain to our villages what you would look like with and without it, but it happened. And we did have you know, folks who were out for multiple days, so we have to capture that in our numbers. Any questions on that? <clears throat> and then year to date, you can see how we're trending. We're doing very well year to date. This is just a map that shows the circuits that serve Elmhurst. We have 46 circuits that run through and or bump up against um, Elmhurst. So we just put this in here as a part of the report. And then this is our system improvement. So this is telling you the work that we either did and or are doing this year to support uh, the city. So we did find one, what we call a, we put one of your circuits in what we call our 1% program. So we found when we have a circuit that has six or more outages within a rolling year, that's not good performance. So when we find those, we pull them, we section those out and they go into a special program. You had one last year, you had one this year, and we have done all the work to improve the service on both of those circuits already. So that's already done. For distribution automation, we had one circuit in the plan to install one this year, so that's upcoming. For underground residential distribution cable program, we had one circuit in 2020 um, that we worked on for you. We don't have any of those in the program this year. For the wood pole program, uh, we had one pole in 2020 that we had to reinforce and or replace. And then we have circuit inspections. That's where we come out proactively and the guys walk the line to see if there's any issues. And then we put a plan together so we could get them proactively. So last year, you had, uh, we looked at 28 circuits. We had 59 corrective maintenance items that we took care of last year. This year, we had 31, and those are already taken care of. The report that the council has, I believe you have the full bone blown report. You can see those circuits and the work that we've done on each of them in the full report. Okay. And that's it. So just wanted to give you an idea of the work that we do and are doing and you know how we support the council. So I'm going to stop here a second for questions. Yes, sir. Um, I thought it might be a good idea, Cynthia, if you would talk about the yes. app. Yes. Um, do we have many people that already have downloaded the ComEd app? Do you love it? Well, I mean, as much as you can love an app, I suppose. <laughs> Well, if you go to your app store, you can download um, the ComEd app. Mm -hmm. And what that's going to do for you is going to help you keep track. When there's an outage, you can look on the app and see what is going on. Now, you can always call our call center, but that's no fun. Who wants to talk to us? It's quicker if you can certainly take a look at an app, although 1-800-EDISON-1 still works. I would absolutely encourage you to do that. Um, the city has... Um, another application where they can see some additional things for the whole city but for customers i would absolutely encourage you to do that if you haven't already i'm just getting good at downloading apps I was not good at that and i hate new things so <laughs> but i do have that app any any questions about that alderman brennan i don't have a question on the app but uh cynthia thank you for the uh the presentation you mentioned a, uh, an event, a storm in 2020. Um, I, I'm curious, it was a pretty long outage and I totally understand yes. you know, mother nature, but how, uh, I'm, I'm curious, how did Elmhurst compare, if you look at the same statistics with municipalities that you know, were similarly impacted and maybe I wouldn't expect you to have that off, you know, up your sleeve. Uh, so there, therefore, I would be interested in that information. Okay. Um, but but how does ComEd prioritize uh, outages as severe as that? So this is how it it works. Um, Elmhurst was my hardest hit town. I have 18 communities, all DuPage County. You guys were my hardest hit. So I think we were on the phone multiple times a day as we worked through different issues. Uh, so there are, you know, 20 people that do my job. All of us have, you know, municipalities that we manage. So that's why when we have something like this, we open six JOCs, those joint operating centers, so that we can talk to all of the municipalities and they can tell us what the priorities are. So if you have, say, 
seven critical facilities down. We open those JOCs so we can say, okay, Jim, which one is number one? Which ones have backup? Where do you want us to go first? We work with the city to get, to get that information from you so that we, because we have them all as critical based on the list that we have. So that's how we prioritize. Um, when you're looking at crews, they, you know, operating looks at, you know, how many crews can go where, how many folks are gonna be coming in to mutually support, and where are those crews gonna go. Initially, when the storm happens, that's probably the hardest thing for us, because one, we gotta come out and see for the, for the, for the outages that we didn't pick right back up, because we, for switching, we have to go out and see what's, what's going on. Is it a tree crew? What, or is it, is it just wires down? Is it, what's going on? And so that sometimes the crew that gets there, they're, the first folks are dan damage assessors. And those folks are looking to see, okay, this is, you know, this section here, we got 10 trees down, the estimated time of restore is this. But initially we give you an estimated restore time based on history, but that could be very wrong. Um, so we prioritize based on the number of customers out, critical facilities, is it a hospital down? We have to look at all of those things. Thank you, that, that seems like a very reasonable approach. Thanks. You're welcome. And I did get your other question. I'm happy to okay. check and see, and I'll get back to Jim and he can communicate with you if that's okay. Perfect, thank okay. you. Anything else? Alderman Toledo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight, Mrs. Thomas. Um, I'm not going to harp on reliability because since the time that I joined this council and moved to the city of Elmhurst, I think that um, Comet has made a lot of improvements. So thank you for that and please keep it coming. Yes, ma'am. Um, on the work um, that has been completed in 2020 and 2021, I'd like to, I wish that I could have seen the wood pole program plus one more than what you had on there. Okay. Because there is a wood pole in my neighborhood that we've been trying to get ComEd to fix for over six months. <laughs> is, it, is it one that is, and I got you, so I'm happy to take a look at that. <laughs> I got that, your ear. <laughs> that, there you go. That's fine. I'm happy to, um, you know, give you my card and I can follow up on it. Yeah. So first thing, you know, I'd look to see where it is in the system. Is it one that we have marked to replace or... Um, they refurbish those poles sometimes and reinforce them. I, I can take a look and see. Sure. I'm happy to do sure. that. Thank you. You're welcome. Alderman Dunn. Um, yeah, Cynthia, I know that uh, ComEd was doing a lot of, I, I guess you could consider it storm hardening um, years yes, ago, a few years ago. <clears throat> Special switches, I, I forget what they were called, and then there was some kind of apparatus up on the wires that... DA devices. What are they called? Distribution automation devices, I believe is what you're speaking about. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a couple things that were really for storm hardening, but I didn't really see those in the plan. Are you done with that, or is it still something that's going on? Storm hardening is... There's a, there's a team <laughs> that looks at storm hardening specifically, so it's not in this report, to answer your question. What's in this report is all the maintenance work that we do. So if it's, um, we have to replace underground cable, we have to do the tree trimming, all of those things are in this report. Storm hardening is a whole separate report. And they look at that annually to see where we need to harden at. And you're right, there's, you know, there's special, you know, special material that they use to harden the lines and what have you. I can certainly see if I can pull a report from that team, it's just not one that I, sure. I bring forward annually. Like me to do that? Okay. All right. Any other questions for me? Oops. Uh, Alderman Molnar, is it about your branch? Go ahead. I knew you had to say that. I just want to uh, say that, you know, I appreciate all the work that Comet has done since the beginning when we first started having problems in Elmhurst, and the storm hardening has been something that's helped a lot. We just hope that that continues the process. If there's more that needs to be done, that we finish it. Uh, it's just been a wonderful change from where we were 10 years ago, 15 years ago. It yes, was sir. pretty bad, and now it's gotten so much better because of the work that you've done and your team has done, so I appreciate that. And you take that back to your team. I'm going to take it back to them. Thank you so much for that. You know, we feel the same way. It's important that we're able to continue to do the maintenance work and keep the system in the shape that it should be. There are some cities that I won't name 
because that's not appropriate that you know we've seen on tv that really struggle when we have a big event and where we we had a big event last night and you know we're we've almost restored everyone but that's due to the work that we do every day so thank you for that and we certainly want to continue uh continue that effort okay other questions Here's Nat, thank you for coming out. We appreciate the attention you pay to us in Elmhurst and the number of years you've been with us. So it's, uh, we look forward to working in the next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you, Council. No applause, huh? No? Okay. <laughs> I was kidding, thank you. I gotta try that line. All right. Uh, <laughs> Item four, receipt of written communication from the public. Does anyone have any written communications that they would like to deliver for the, to the council? Mayor, there is one posted on All right. the agenda. Thank you. Online, four docs. Um, any others? Very good. With, uh, item five then, public forum. Uh, this is an opportunity for uh, residents or non-residents for that matter to address the council on any matter they so choose. We'd ask that you keep your comments to three minutes so that the council can get on with its other business and so that others have an opportunity to speak. Uh, Clerk Tamer, uh, do you have a list of anyone who signed up for public forum? Yes, Mayor. We have Lynn uh, Zapla-Tayob. I'll step over to the microphone in the back behind Ms. Thomas there. actually the one behind you there. Oh, okay. Thank you. If you'd state your name, address is optional. Good evening. My name is Lynn Zapla, and I live at 395 North Larch Avenue. I am continuing to request that the City Council deny the zoning variance request at 348 North Larch Avenue. The conditional use request is only necessary for more than four unrelated people to live together. However, operating a sober home does not require having more than four. Furthermore, I have serious concerns about the conditions to be attached to the request. In the last city council meeting, we heard from Mr. J. Webb, who told us he lives at the home and contends that they have rules that they stand by. But how do self-described family members not see someone for three to four days and only discover him deceased from an overdose when someone called the house to ask why he had missed his court date. Also, this resident, who had been living at the home for about a year, had previously overdosed in a vehicle a few weeks prior to, unfortunately, his fatal one. According to Freedom House's Zero Tolerance rules, use of drugs or alcohol will result in an immediate discharge. But that did not happen in this case. Here is a brief roadmap of events that have occurred that are of relevance. First, Mr. Webb and Mr. Vissian asked for a conditional use. Next, in the application, Mr. Webb detailed the house rules. Then, in a report dated April 27th, <clears throat> 2021, the DPC rescinded its November 2020 disapproval report and replaced it with a new report recommending approval with five conditions. One of the conditions being that all occupants 
must abide by the house rules. However, we know that the house rules were not previously followed because of the death of a resident and the fact that he wasn't discovered until much later, possibly days. Ms. Appled, you're, you're over your three minutes if you could bring I will. I will finish up, thank, thank you. you. This doesn't seem consistent with the family relationship that Mr. Webb described. When will be the next time I see an ambulance coming down the street? And I pray that it's not stopping at 348. I hope it's not soon. And I am sure that Mr. Webb's endeavors are well-meaning, but it doesn't seem the operation of the rules or conditions that currently exist provide support or enough safety. City Council members, I respectfully request that you vote against the conditional use permit for 348 <coughs> North Larch Avenue. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Next, we have Ann Grilecki Anderson. Good evening, my name is Ann Anderson. I live at 344 North Larch. In my remarks on August 20th, 2019, I cited my then 19 years of professional employment in social services, as well as my 10 years as a resident on Larch Avenue. I take this opportunity tonight to restate four points that I've raised over the last two years. First, best practices and standards for operation. If you grant this precedent-setting ordinance in our city, how will you ensure the facility operates safely and in accordance with best practices for both its residents and its neighbors? If you Google the applicant organization, the description indicates a halfway house in Elmhurst, yet the application identifies the property as a group home, or is it a sober living home? If the residence itself lacks a clear identity, how can it pursue best practices and standard for operation? There is a National Sober Living Association. There is a Commission on Accreditation of Rehabilitation Facilities. While it seems daunting in the face of a fair housing lawsuit threat to present the applicant with additional conditions, it seems that now is your opportunity to set this operation on the right course. If you do grant this variance, which I ask that you don't, I would request that you ask the applicant to pursue certification or accreditation either for the person running the program or the residence itself, both of which are lacking, to promote best practices and promote high standards for which Elmhurst is known. Secondly, the property value. A section 22.26 of the Elmhurst Zoning Ordinance indicates seven standards for conditional use. One standard states that the conditional use will not diminish and impair property values within the neighborhood. I'm not sure how this is guaranteed, but I ask the council this. Should my property value decrease, yet my taxes remain the same following this zoning change, will the city council make an allowance or an accommodation for me? What is my recourse as a taxpayer and a homeowner? Third, financial option for the four men residing there. The organization's website indicates that residents are charged 125 to 225 per week with the utilities included. Earlier this month, I proposed that four men could flourish in the sober environment and that it not be necessary to increase occupancy to seven. Deliberately giving himself the last word of the public comment period, Mr. Webb countered that limiting the residents to four individuals would not support payment of the homeowner's mortgage. At the risk of making a false assumption, I would suggest the home no longer has a mortgage. However, if it does, an average of $175 per week with four residents brings the total to $2,800. I live next door. $2,800 exceeds my mortgage. Four men could absolutely reside in that property if the goal is simply sober living. If the goal is to grow the Vissian Family Trust, however, as noted on page four of the application, then you definitely need the seven men to make $5,000 a month. My last point is about operation outside of the law. Prior to this case coming before the council in 2019, the facility operated with an illegal number of residents for at least 16 months. The application itself acknowledges and almost boasts of this illegal operation. 
the organization submitted its conditional use application only when caught acting illegally. What is the consequence for the homeowner or the tenant for this blatant disregard for city ordinance? I argue that the past behavior of this homeowner is relevant. While he's not the primary applicant, he is still the homeowner responsible for his property and his home on Larch. I hope you have listened to my remarks and my neighbors over the last two years. We care so much about our community and we ask that you do the same. Act with intentionality and thoughtful leadership on the issue of substance use and recovery, an issue that we all have agreed demands attention, rather than simply agreeing to this, un this existing unapproved model. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Mary Ellen Reeves. Okay, and Annette Armstrong. Good evening. My name is Mary Ellen Reeves, and I am the president of the Market Square Condo Association. Uh, Annette and I are on the board, and we live directly across the street from the Lennar construction and from the 195 construction that recently was completed. Um, the construction of the Lennar building and the 195 building has brought a lot of traffic issues. The amount of traffic, the speeding down Addison, the accidents uh, along Addison, uh, the move-ins and move-outs on, on Addison itself. The subject of safety and traffic was brought up at a city council meeting before the Lennar building broke ground for construction. At that council meeting, the board talked about safety when adding so many more residents and cars to the area. <coughs> At the time, we were told that a traffic study was going to be conducted. We have recently been told that the traffic study was delayed due to COVID. As you may know, our landscaping wall has been damaged two times within the last three months. One incident was because a car or truck backed up into the wall while doing a U-turn. The latest incident occurred when a driver tried to complete a U-turn in the middle of Addison. This driver hit one of our owner's cars, then hit the bench, destroyed the bench, and then hit our wall, destroying a large portion of our newly landscaped wall. Thankfully, no one was walking along the street, no one was sitting on the bench, no one was injured this time. The other problems we have on Addison, now that everything is completed in, uh, complete in uh, construction and people are moving in, are deliveries. For myself, we have two entryways in our condo building. If someone, a truck in particular, is parked very close to the exit of that building, it is very hard to see around the truck, causing people to swerve, stop quickly. So deliveries are definitely an issue, including Amazon, UPS, uh, mail de deliveries, FedEx. It's constant. And the problem is, is that if there's no parking there, they double park. And that is definitely an issue. To, or park legally. Or have a moving van taking up three parking spots in order to move into the front of the building. Those are very much issues for us. Um, double parking is common every day. One thing, rather than being part of the problem, I'd like to be part of the solution. What about making the alley behind the Lennar construction and behind the 195 building a one-way, a posted one-way going south, where you don't have to worry about cars going two ways trying to get through a very narrow alley? The other thing that I would like to suggest or think about at the ends of those alleys, especially if you're going south, put in some type of device like you have in the parking garage to let people, kids, moms, women with strollers know that a car is coming. Be alert, be aware, something vocal, something visual. Right now, yes, there's a stop sign posted, but kids are not gonna watch that. So I would suggest that perhaps maybe that would be a good solution to the problem. I know we can't put speed up bumps down Addison. It's on, on many days, it's like the Indianapolis 500 because people want to get across the tracks and they see, they see that it's open and it's like, if I go faster, if I don't stop fully at the stop sign, I'll make it across the tracks. It's very much of a hazard for anyone walking there. Ms. Reeves, so, uh, you're, you're about three and a half minutes. Would you? Oh, sorry. Um, Thank you. Sorry, I will wrap it up. Thank you. 
And some suggestions, rumble sti strips along Addison, a one way only for Addison. What do other municipalities do? What about posted signage, maybe in the middle of the street saying no U-turns? Um, Short term parking. Short term parking, everything that, that we can possibly ask for help because it's becoming out of control and someone's going to get hurt. We're just lucky that that bench didn't have somebody sitting on it. Thank you so much for your time and attention. And thanks for the, thanks for the hard work the council does. We appreciate it. And to our wonderful alder women, Jennifer Varimus and Marty Deuter. <laughs> no applause for that one. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's all that signed up. All right. Uh, that's uh, the end for those who have signed. Is there anyone who wants to give public comment who did not have an opportunity to sign in? All right. If you approach the microphone, state your name, address optional. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm Mark Raff and I live in Elmhurst here. Um, been coming to the to the meetings regarding the issue on Large Street and the and the sober living home for as long as it's been an issue. And um, you know, on 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 the two different sides of this, uh, nothing. I always say that there's just nothing but empathy for the bad neighbor that uh, the poor people of Large Street have had, and that they don't have one now. Whether you had four, whether you had seven, whether you had 15 individuals sober in there, what you've got is a bunch of people that are just sober, and the council's. Uh, uh, recognition that you know a state house at one end and just a guy sober in his parents house is you know there's a whole bunch of gray area in between um, I'd like to publicly just talk about my disappointment though that on one side of this issue you have sober people there's got to be a thousand meetings going on in DuPage County and who's here tonight five six people regarding the sober house and then you've got how many streets in Elmhurst? Where's, you know, where's, where's all the people on Cottage Hill or Belden Avenue or Emroy Avenue or Armitage Avenue here talking about how important this issue is too? It's kind of a shame on both ends that only the people on Larch are here discussing it, and God bless them, and only the few people that are directly affiliated with the Sober House are here. I'm surprised that there's not a thousand people taking this issue very seriously on both sides of it, looking for support for something in between the two uh, uh, far extreme spectrum of sober living and uh, people that are concerned about what their neighborhood might be like if, the, if a little variance was made between four people and seven people. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? All right, we'll bring public forum to, a, oh, one more. Good evening. My name is Justin Reese and I live at 360 North Larch. There's one house in between my house and the applicant. I first want to thank the mayor and those who attended last Monday's speaker presentation, the thoughtful questions that were asked to seek further understanding. I again want to restate my family's affirmation for a sober home at 348 North Larch as long as it operates within the present R2 zoning of our neighborhood and within the guidelines the city has currently established of no more than four non-related individuals. The applicant has not demonstrated in their application dated 7-24-19 how expanding to more than four unrelated persons is related to the nature of the disability. The nature of the disability and the reason for the variance request are not related. I don't feel the city has the oversight and regulation framework in place presently to make an intentional decision to approve the variance request that is inclusive of a cleared guideline of what a sober home in Elmer should look like, how it should be monitored, and basic guidelines of operation. The applicant states he is an addiction recovery professional and he is the only person on site managing. I hope the City Council fully understands what an interventionalist is or is not, and what type of formal and industry accepted credential that is or is not. It is not a license, it is not a doctor, a nurse, a social worker, or a therapist. The personal decision you're making this evening could have a direct impact on someone's well-being, safety, and success, as well as the opposite, if done negligently, without making sure the proper framework and staffing is present. This home is not registered with, nor does it operate within best practice guidelines of accredited organizations like the National Sober Living Home Association. Carpenter Tools Ministries, EIN 20119-6665, had their federal tax exempt status revoked on May 15, 2019 for not filing the required form, as verified as, an out, as of an hour ago on the IRS website. The applicant is not even in good standing as a nonprofit. 
We have been thoughtful in our education, our research, and for helping plan the best possible outcomes for our neighborhood. We have only been asking for the safe operation of a sober home by an actual professional with an organization that operates within the law, within zoning requirements, within best practices from an accredited industry recognized body, and at a bare minimum in good standing with the IRS for their nonprofit. None of these is happening with Carpenter's Tools Ministries. I again urge you to keep the sober home operations within the current R2 zoning for non-related persons. And I will end with, we have a non-credentialed house manager, we have a non-profit not in good standing, and we don't operate under a nationally recognized sober living association and follow best practices. Thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you. I keep thinking, uh, anyone else? Mr. Webb? My name's Jay Webb, and I live at the house and manage the house, and I just had a couple uh, final thoughts and reminders. Um, actually, I, I, I went back and looked today, and uh, 936 days ago, I got my first notice from the city about the sober home. So this has been a long process, and I uh, appreciate everybody being involved from top to bottom. Um, willing or not, uh, I believe we've raised awareness on, on recovery, uh, both sides, and certainly shined a light on the stigma surrounding recovery. Uh, our first client came in in April of 18. Uh, it, uh, as it's been, I don't know, promoted or pushed forward, it hasn't been a revolving door. Um, we've had only 20 clients in three plus years. The program in the house has its few guys that are hunkered in and just like living with the so in a sober environment. And there's other gentlemen that have a plan uh, the so with a solid program and sober living. It's the single most important or efficient way of keeping people sober and getting them to long-term recovery. We're just doing our part to do it. Uh, you know, I'm not sure if uh, people are aware but uh, overdose deaths uh, outnumber all that died in the Vietnam and Korean War together. We're doing our effort, our little bit here to help it. Sending somebody back from 30 or 60 days in treatment in a halfway house back into the environment to which they came from, either a household or a neighborhood, is not good. That's where they overdose. They've been cleaned for 60 days, 90 days, the system isn't, using, uh, isn't used to it, and they go back and try their heroin, and we lose them because they're not, their uh, tolerance is down. I just uh, got a group of guys there that are living as a family, and yes, we had to deal with a couple deaths, actually, and we did it as a family. We work, we go to meetings, we take vacations, we see our families, we have bank accounts, <coughs> and we help others, and that's what we do in the program. Um, I've been in town for 50 years, and I've been involved in quite a bit of stuff. Uh, I think Elmhurst uh, should be in the front, front end of this whole program. We need more of this. There's nothing, very little treatment and recovery options on the east side of DuPage County, and I think this is something that knowing Elmhurst, they should be involved in. And uh, one last thought, you know, the hardest decision and the right decision sometimes are the same thing. Tonight, approving the house would be the right thing to do, and it's the law. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Anybody else? All right, we'll close public forum. There people, uh, is anyone on the phone? Anyone? Mike Cop, do you know? We're through the line, but someone just be listening for some of the things on the agenda. I don't know if they want to keep public comment or not. We'll is there anyone on the phone line that wants to make public comment? 
Last call on the phone. All right, we'll close public forum then. <coughs> Moving on to item six, the consent agenda. Is there any item on the consent agenda that any alderman wants to uh, pull for further discussion or to vote against? Alderman Polumsky. Item 6.16. Item 6.16. And I'm going to, I'm anyone sorry. else? Yeah. Well, hold on a second. You're looking at mics down too. Yeah, is this? It's not that. No, they're on the, uh, the line up above. All right. I don't know what's going on, but that's what we're hearing. <coughs> Thank you. Let's just pause for a minute. I'll tell you what we'll do is um, we're going to go through the consent agenda and then we'll come back to public forum and see if there's anyone that wants to speak just so we can keep moving forward. So Alderman Polumsky, uh, you've pulled item 6.16. Is there any other item that any alderman wants to remove from the consent agenda? All right, I'm going to take off the consent agenda uh, item 6.22, it needs some changes and we'll bring it back at another meeting. Um, any other changes? All right, can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda minus items 6.16 and 6.22? Alderman Mulliner. You can have Jackie read it after the motion. Oh yes, I forgot the new portion of our program. It's the mm -hmm. Jackie we Tamer show, going, I forgot. All right. Going. Uh, let's put that in abeyance for a minute. Would you be so kind as to withdraw your motion, Alderman Molnar? We have a new procedure, and I will call on uh, Clerk Tamer to read the consent agenda. Thank you. Mm. Okay, 6.1 minutes of the executive session, meeting of the Elmer City Council on June Ritter, Polumsky, and Park. 6.5, Case 20, P20, conditional use permit for planned unit development. Um, Dermody Properties, 837 South Riverside Drive, final PUD approval, 6.6, .6, Case 21, P07, District 205 Transition Center, conditional use permit, 407 West St. Charles, 6.7, Report, AT&T IP Flex SIP Service Proposal, 6.8, Adopting a Disclosure Compliance Policy, 6.9, Report Elmhurst History Museum Letter of Intent, 388 Carroll Lane. 6.10 Report Elmhurst City Center 2021 Events. 6.11 Report Second Amendment to the Comprehensive Intergovernmental Agreement between the City of Elmhurst and Elmhurst School District 205. 6.12 2021 Storm Sewer Geopolymer Lining Project. 6.13 Report Native Area Maintenance and Restoration. 6.14 report TV inspection truck, 6.15 an ordinance granting an amended conditional use permit for a planned unit development and approving a final plat of subdivision for the construction of two industrial buildings at the property commonly known as 6.15 to 6.35 West Lake Street, Elmhurst, Illinois. 6.16 an ordinance granting, that's right, thank you. 6.17 an ordinance amending section 29.10 entitled wastewater service charges of chapter 29 entitled private water and sewer systems of the municipal code of ordinances of the city of Elmhurst, Illinois. 6.18, an ordinance extending temporary executive powers pursuant to section 3.16 of Elmhurst municipal code and pursuant to 65 ILCS 5 forward slash 11 dash 1 dash 6. 6.9, ordinance approving and authorizing the execution of a non-exclusive <coughs> license agreement by and between Elmhurst Running Club, Inc. and the City of Elmhurst, DuPage, and Cook Counties, Illinois. 6.20, an ordinance waiving bid and authorizing the issuance of a notice of award purchase order for the purchase of new traffic signal controller equipment. 
6.21, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of a professional services agreement with Copcore Pro LLC for workers' compensation consulting services. 6.22 is re uh, removed. 6.23, a resolution authorizing the issuance of a notice of award for the 2021 Streetlight Pole Painting Project, project number 21-19. 6.24, a resolution authorizing the purchase of one ground level loader trailer to replace unit PW-128T. 6.25, a resolution authorizing the purchase of one Husqvarna 5, excuse me, FS500-D48 horsepower diesel saw with a 26-inch cutting blade. 6.26, a resolution authorizing the issuance of a notice of award and authorizing the execution of a contract for the base bid of the 2021 pavement striping program. A resolution, uh, 6.27, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of a renewal contract for the 2021 crack sealing and seal coating program. And 6.28, a resolution authorizing the issuance of a notice of award and authorizing the execution of a contract for the 2021 pavement patching program for the city of Elmhurst. Thank you, Clerk Tamer. <laughs> Take a breath. Uh, Alderman <laughs> Molnar with a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Alderman Cahill, second. Clerk Tamer, would you call the roll? Mulliner? Aye. Brennan? Aye. Verimus? Aye. Deuter? Aye. Dunn? Aye. Hill? Aye. Polemski? Aye. Jensen? Aye. Toledo? Aye. Cahill? Aye. Park? Aye. Conquest? Aye. Mestito's absent. 12 ayes, 0 nays, 1 absent. 12 ayes, 0 nays, 1 absent. The consent agenda passes minus items 6.16 and 6.22. So we bought a little time here to see if we can resolve the other issue. Uh, Alderman, uh, City Manager, do we have a procedure? Yeah, first let me apologize to those residents on the line who are wanting to speak. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to disconnect the line and we're going to redial in. So if you would uh, disconnect, hang up and give us a couple of minutes to uh, reset that connection and then dial back in and we should be able to um, hear uh, their comments. All right, so about a minute uh, we're going to, before they dial in. Yeah, a minute or two, my cop is resetting it as we All right, speak. So we'll hold on that then. 6.16. That's hanging up. Pardon me? You know, item 6.16. Right now? Up to you. Might as well. All right, while we're waiting on that, so we're disconnecting the line, we'll go back to public forum, but uh, let's uh, go back to item 6.16. Clerk Tamer, are you prepared to yep. read the ordinance? Thank you. The resolution. Uh, Sorry. The ordinance, 6.16. Yes. Yes. An ordinance granting a conditional use permit for the development of an educational institution on the property commonly known as 407 West St. Charles Road, Elmhurst, Illinois, which is the District 205 Transition Center. <clears throat> I have a motion to put this before the Council. Alderman Polumsky, seconded by Alderman Molliner. Alderman Polumsky. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is an ordinance that um, accompanies um, 6.6. .6. It's a report about the Transition Center um, for 205, um, which used to be the Park District building, the Abbey. Um, our committee has recommended approval of the report. We also did recommend that we suspend the rules so that District 205 could proceed a little bit more quickly with their um, building process. The reason why I'm pulling it is because it ended up in the consent agenda and because um, it's an ordinance, we, it should be a little bit more prominent and um, isolated, so it is um, in a different portion of the agenda. So I just wanted to make sure it was pulled from the consent. Yeah, and we would have to approve the 6.6 .6 before the 6.16. .6. Other comments on 6.16 .6 questions, debate? There being none, Clerk Tamer, if you'll call the roll. Mulliner? Aye. Brennan? Aye. Baremus? Aye. Deuter? Aye. Dunn? Aye. Hill? Aye. Polemski? Aye. Jensen? Aye. Toledo? Aye. Cahill? Aye. Park? Aye. Conquest? Aye. 
12 ayes, zero nays, one absent. 12 ayes, zero nays, one absent. Item 6.16 passes. Um, Uh, Council, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to declare a recess for five minutes. We'll come back at uh, 835. That's right. And then we'll pick up again with public forum. So we're in recess.
All right, we'll call the meeting back to order. Uh, we're going back to public comment. I don't know how we, we have a list of people on the line. I, well, we'll just have to be polite and see who goes first. I'd say alphabetical order, but you don't know who's there. So I know Kathleen Sullivan's there, so I can start there. Is, are you there, Ms. Sullivan? I am. All right, if you'd like to um, state your name and proceed with public comment. Sure, Kathleen Sullivan. Um, one second. It's hard to do this with the, with the phone. It's coming back in my ear. Anyway, um, first I'd like to say after uh, last night's storm, that was always the uh, biggest fear was that water would come in your basement while you were hiding from a tornado. So you can all... Uh, um, who had something to do with it, be proud of what you did to fix and address flooding in Elmhurst because we really didn't have a lot of complaints on our flooding page last night about water, uh, mostly just about the tornado. So uh, just keep that all in mind. Um, ComEd, since you're there, thank you again for what you've done. It's a lot better than it was a decade ago when we started looking at all these things. Um, but my main issue tonight is to talk about Eligo. And um, we didn't get the original letter from Eligo, but we did get one from ComEd. We opted out on time, uh, several days before uh, the due date, and um, kept a record of our confirmation number. Um, we found that we are still having Eligo appear on our bill, even though we opted out. So we called Eligo on Friday uh, twice, because in between we called ComEd, uh, they said they have the original confirmation number, but um, somehow we're still being billed by Eligo. And um, they didn't return my call, the second one that they promised on Monday, on Friday. They said they'd call by 6. So then I emailed them again yesterday, um, and they didn't return that call by the end of the day today, which I suggested would keep me from doing a public comment tonight. So um, you really have some problems with the company you hired to do to aggregate electricity, and they need to be addressed. And they aren't responding to the people who don't want to be their customers. So as the big dog who is their customers, um, we need you guys to help with that. So um, we would like to be opted out, and um, we want you to be aware that we're probably not the only ones in town who've had the issue. We're just the ones who know this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, would someone like to, uh, did you, you have names of the people who are on there? Um, well, let, we'll just try someone to start speaking. Jennifer. Hi, my name, my name is Jennifer Maurer. Thank you. Go proceed, Ms. Maurer. A, I'm a resident of Larch Avenue, and I am echoing many of the comments you've heard already from my neighbors. Um, I am here again virtually this time asking the council to please decline the variance request. I agree wholeheartedly with um, Mark Raffin that absolutely Elmhurst should be on, on the front end of providing social housing and providing support to people in recovery. And I, in, some, in part, agree with the applicant, Mr. Webb, that you need to do the right thing. And the problem we have with the situation is the right thing has not been done all along. And to to approve this variance would be a further continuation of not doing the right thing. The law, the fair housing law, variances can be lawfully defined yeah, no me. between the disability and the request. This is not a request for a ramp or wheelchair. This is a request to have seven people in a house simply because that house already has seven bedrooms. As my neighbors have stated, the sober home can thrive with fewer than seven residents. If they wish to open a sober home with seven residents, they may do so in an existing R4 zone. I respectfully request that the committee please maintain the R2 zoning of this neighborhood. We welcome this sober home in our neighborhood. We truly do. I said this at the last meeting, I will be the first person to bring my children and knock on the door of this sober home on Halloween. We like Snickers and Kit Kat for the record. However, I do believe that the existing zoning should be maintained. And I ask Mr. Ed to hear our concerns. Please hear our concerns about the national standards and the safety of the residents. We want to work with you. Please meet us halfway. That said, I do ask that the committee please keep 
the existing zoning until such time that the residents mm-hmm. of this neighborhood are more comfortable with what, with how this home is run. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Maurer. Uh, is there another person on the line? Is there anyone I think else? she disconnected. I think she disconnected. All right. This may be the last uh, meeting we have. The technology will all be back in person in July. So, all right, is, is the other person redialed in? All right, I'm going to wait a, about 30 seconds, and if we don't hear anyone come back on, we'll proceed. All right, we're gonna close public forum for the second time tonight. See how that goes. Um, we'll go to item seven, committee reports. Uh, Clerk Tamer, would you read the report? We're in order. Did we um, take care of 6.22? Oh, I pulled 6.22, we're gonna bring it back another time. It's off for the okay. night. Is, did someone just dial back in? No, all right. So I, we're going to go to item seven, Clerk Tamer, 7.1 rather. Therefore, the Development, Planning, and Zoning Committee recommends that the City Council approve the requested conditional use permit with, with five conditions. The City Attorney is hereby directed to prepare the necessary documents for City Council approval. Signed, Danny Palumski, Chair, Mark A. Mulliner, Vice Chair, and Emily Bastido, Alderwoman, Ward 6. Um, just a moment. Yeah, that, that should be the yeah. previous committee. I think it was signed by Alderman Honquist, former chair, Alderman Mulliner, former vice chair, and, and Alderman Dunn, committee member. But with that, do we have a, I'm not sure, we'll be a little confused. I'm not sure. What, Alderman Honquist, a motion. We'll do it at the same time. All right, and we'll take a second from Alderman Mulliner. Um, it's your report, Alderman Honquest. Thank Proceed. You. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. So uh, I want to start tonight, uh, as everyone has heard, this is kind of a unique case, several different elements. One is the fact that we've spent uh, so much time at council discussing it and reviewing it, uh, including the training we had last week, uh, which I was not able to attend, but which I have been well versed on over the last year as we've gone through this. So tonight I just wanted to cover uh, kind of three main areas uh, that I hope will align our thinking and also explain both to the neighborhood and to the applicant kind of uh, both the process and the decision criteria and why we ended up uh, recommending uh, this report. So first I want to start with uh, a lot of what we heard, uh, which is the neighborhood's perspective. Uh, it is true this house in uh, the last couple of decades has been a problem house. Uh, the owner, uh, for whatever background, I don't have the exact details, would lease the house. Uh, some of the story I heard, that person would then sublease the house to a whole variety of people and there were a whole host of problems that occurred. So, you know, coming from the, from the perspective of the neighborhood, I, I understand their frustration. Uh, this has not been what most of us would term a, a regular neighborhood experience or a regular neighborhood, or a regular neighbor in, in this neighborhood. So uh, I think a lot of the um, anxiety around what's going on with this property is tied, obviously, into its history, and I can obviously respect that. And I think we've heard that from the neighborhood. Um, having said that, as a council, part of what you heard last week, and as a committee, what we spent time doing is uh, obviously looking at the applicant um, and the case. And I will say, as chair of the committee, having had 
a bit more time with both our legal team and with staff, uh, shared the frustration in the neighborhood. It was difficult to get a hold of, of the applicant. Uh, we requested information that we did not get back in a timely manner. And quite frankly, it looked like much of what we were hearing from the neighborhood was consistent with what we were experiencing Why? as a committee. <laughs> Give me a couple minutes. Um, whoever's on the phone, if you could mute your line, that would help. I bet you're doing a little ventriloquism, but go ahead. <laughs> so anyway, um, so as we started to review the case, uh, that became evident to me, and, and I had my own personal frustrations about how we were working through this. And as that was happening parallel, uh, we were obviously getting legal advice on how to handle the case. And as all of you, as many of you know, we, we do have a lot of new aldermen, but as, as these cases come forward, not every case is the same, and every case gets treated differently based on the circumstances of that case. This is no different. Um, and as I've said many times in committee, and I'll state again tonight before I go th through uh, some of the other comments that are specific to the legalities, we are a municipality. We ultimately roll up to a county, to the state, and to the federal government. So regardless of what our ordinances say or don't say, regardless how pristine they might be or, or not be in any given case, we have to look at not only our ordinances, but those of the state, the county, and the federal government. This is one of those cases, uh, we've had a few of them in the last few years, where uh, the federal government has a clear uh, edict as far as how the law is defined and addressed. I am now going to read what I asked our city attorney to put together. For those of you who don't know our city attorney, Don Strino, he's uh, a very competent man himself and his firm has been very competent serving us over the, over the eight years I've been here. Uh, so as they were advising me on this case, I obviously got educated to some degree, although I'm not an attorney, on you know, what the, the elements of this case are from a federal perspective and how they should be applied to the city, as did my fellow committeemen. So I will read what, just for the record, and for all of you, uh, what he laid out tonight. This application for conditional use as we've heard, spent significant time before the Planning and Zoning Commission and the Planning and Zoning Committee, which is us, the three of us here at City Council. During that time, we have had extensive consultations with the city attorney, as I just laid out. This applicant has alerted the city, alerted the city to the fact that the zoning application has been submitted on behalf of persons who are recognized as having disabilities. The applicant has raised to the city its rights for reasonable accommodation from the city's zoning ordinance pursuant to certain federal statutes, the FH, FHA, Fair Housing Act, and the ADA, Americans with the D Disabilities Act. The city is fully aware of the federal rights provided to the disabled under the FHA and the ADA. This is a highly factual inquiry and involves a technical legal analysis in light of existing federal case authority interpreting these federal statutes. I'll point that out. Again, I'm not an attorney, but I trust the attorneys we have, and I spent some time talking through this and challenging this when we were in committee, and I would agree with that statement. The city is also aware of a similar case involving very similar issues arising from the village of Hinsdale that is the subject of two lawsuits presently pending uh, in federal court in Chicago, Trinity Sober Homes versus Hinsdale and the Department of Justice versus Hinsdale. These cases provide the city with directly analogous uh, illustrations of the operation of the FHA and the ADA in relation to zoning issue accommodations to disabled persons seeking to establish so sober home facilities in areas zoned as single family residential. It also appears that the city's current ordinance restricting single family group home occupancy to four unrelated persons with disability is also likely unconstitutional and not enforceable. It is the untimely decision the city, it is ultimately, I'm sorry, not untimely, it is ultimately the decision of the city council as to whether it should grant the application and accommodation to allow seven unrelated individuals to re reside in a single family resident in an area of the city zoned for single family residences. 
If the city were to deny zoning application, city needs to show legitimate governmental interest in denying reasonable requests for accommodation and show the burden imposed upon the city for accommodation. This is very difficult. I, we can have questions and talk about it, but our ability to do that is, is a mountain to climb. I believe the applicants, this is our uh, attorney Andy Acker, I believe the applicants FHA and ADA disability rights require the city to allow them the accommodation requested in the application for conditional use permit. Those are the last of his comments. So, excuse me. This was completely consistent with what we discussed. It was in the committee notes uh, for anyone that want to go back, I, ha I actually asked Attorney Acker uh, in committee to summarize what he just put in writing again so that it was into the record and so everyone understood that element of what we're discussing. So that, that was my second piece. My third piece is uh, I want to address what I've heard from the community, which is uh, have you guys thought through this? Do you really understand this? I don't think they're unfair questions, especially given the, some of the legalities and complexities of this. So um, I also don't want it to seem like we're hiding in some way or fearful of a federal lawsuit because I don't think that's why we made the decision we made. That simply informed us of, of a set of laws that we had to consider, as all of us do. Uh, as uh, Andy stated, we have the ability tonight to decline this and let the chips fall where they may. It's his recommendation that doing so, we'll end up in a lawsuit, but that is our right as a council. So in effect, his point to me is this is a business decision, and if we think taking on <laughs> both the applicant and the federal government is a good business decision, and we think we have a case, then that's our decision. Having said that, um, my third point, as I mentioned previously, I don't want people thinking we're kind of hiding behind a federal set of laws or the pursuit of a lawsuit. Uh, I'll give my own personal experience. My first job was in a group home, 22, in <clears throat> inner city New Orleans. It was a very tough scenario. I learned a lot about group homes. I learned a lot about not-for-profits. Uh, much of what I've heard, unfortunately, kind of puts the not-for-profit uh, under some sort of trial, if you will. You know, is it a well-run profit? Does it do everything it's supposed to do? Number one, based on my experience, many not-for-profits don't run a very good business. They're mission-oriented people. They set up shop. They try to do it the best they can. They raise money as they can. I'm still involved in the one I worked with. We've got 14 locations across the U.S. And, and Central and South America. It focuses on children. Uh, it's, it's well run and it still struggles for money. Many of the affiliates struggle for money on a regular basis. Uh, not to mention all the regulations that go with trying to run uh, you know, group homes. This is a bit unique. I know it's not exactly apples to apples a group home. It's a sober home living. but. Uh, to our code, which I started with, which our code is not always perfect, it fit into that definition of what a, of, of what a group home would mean in Elmhurst. And if you go back through the history, when this, this home, uh, the sober home was first kind of called out for uh, being quote unquote illegal, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, and they started through the adjudication process here in the city, it was recommended for them to solve their problem with the city to go to, through a group home designation. So it was the recommendation of the city through the adjudication process to go to the group home situation, just, just for the fact. Um, now talking about some of the, the legalities or non-legalities uh, back to our code and the decision we need to make. Uh, so based on my own personal experience and what I've dealt with and what I've learned about this case, um, I would, regardless of the federal issues that we're facing, grant the conditional use. I think, as I've learned through this process, uh, they are running a legitimate sober home. It's definitely got issues. Uh, as I learned through the process and I lived, when you go into a group home, you are expected to be treated in a similar fashion as any neighbor. 
I personally know people in town that have lost children to overdoses. We probably all do. It's a horrible situation. It's, an it's, it's, it's a serious problem in our country in, a, in many different ways, whether it's alcohol or drugs. It's very difficult to get a, a perfect scenario uh, in circumstances to allow people to move into a neighborhood and live and not create some sort of issues. These people have issues. It's no different than any other family. I have seven people living in my family. Five of them are my kids. I wouldn't mind kicking a couple of them out to get down to four, but I can't do that. <laughs> so we have too many cars. My neighbor has five kids. He has too many cars. It's, it's painful. We're at that point in our life. So, uh, you know, the joke there, the parallel is that, that, that this group of people needs to be treated in a similar fashion to another group of people. And none of us, uh, either in a neighborhood or us as a council, in my opinion, has the right to come over the top and say, well, you people need to live this way, or therefore you need to get out. It's a very dangerous precedent. And actually, it's why there's fair housing if you go back to our history as a country. So uh, with, with that said, uh, I could go on and, and talk for quite a bit of time on my own experience. I'm not. I just wanted people to know where I stood on this case. Uh, there's multiple things considered. It's not a knee-jerk reaction. I think we're, as a group, well-educated on, on the issues that came before us. As everyone knows up here, the commission at the time they heard the case denied it. So we had to look at that, and that was in the forefront of my mind when I started going through it. Well, this should probably be denied based on what the commission recommended. So we spent a lot of time on this, trying to understand it. We've had other cases like this that you know, we've reversed because we got educated through the process. So for all those reasons, I ask for your support um, for the committee report tonight uh, and hope that we can put this issue to rest and move forward. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Alderman Hanquist. Other comments? Anyone else want to speak on the issue? Alderman Dunn. Yeah, I, I will speak since I did sign the report. Um, just a couple things. I think um, Chair Hanquist did an excellent job of uh, kind of delineating where we've been with this and, and some of the reasons why the report was signed. Um, I think what well, we, we have as a, a city, we have rules um, and as a city council and we need to follow our rules. Um, by right, any home can have up to four unrelated people. Um, you go above that, you need conditional approval for it. And conditional approval, to turn that down, is to be pretty compelling. Um, you know, not, and not that we believe that these people could, could cause problems, uh, that, that, um, that having more having these type of people and and more than four of them um is going to be a problem whereas less less was not so i you know i don't i think we need to follow our rules and um we uh, this is not without precedent so i asked the city staff for some um, some other cases where we've had uh, more than four in a home. There's a um, home on West Avenue that has uh, no limit, uh, no more than eight people. Um, it is a uh, conditional use for an elder care respite service. Um, again, no more than eight people there. Um, there's also property on Van Buren. Um, this is no longer in existence but it was a senior citizen home um and uh there there was uh that particular home had seven bedrooms um so um also on monterey uh there was a group home uh from 2016 to 2019 um with more than four people so you know we this isn't the first time that city council has approved going above four for a group home type environment whether it's elderly 
or a sober living uh, community. Um, so I thought it was important to point that out that there's some precedents actually within our own city. Um, but I, I, I think I, I was, um, I think the five conditions that w were placed on this approval um, are appropriate and are um, important. I think the, um, uh, this place has seven bedrooms. They asked for seven. They could have up to eight, um, but they only have seven bedrooms, so th that's the limit. The, the applicant indicated that um, very rarely do they get up to that amount, um, even, and the average was you know, 4.5, between four and five people, um, because there are people residing in the house, getting um, in a better state and then moving out and then and others are moving in. Um, so there is flux in who is living in the home and, uh, and, and trying to support the, the, um, the, the other residents there. Um, I know that one of the conditions is to abide by the house rules. It's certainly tough to enforce, but we do have a copy of their house rules and uh, I, I, th I think it would be um, certainly valid to continually look at those to make sure that um, the things that might occur there uh, are complying with the house rules. Um, I know there was a lot of residents were concerned about the ownership and if it turned over uh, and could someone else come in and operate a sober living home. So we have conditions to limit that. Um, and, and I think th those are important uh, as well to address the residents need uh, or concerns and um, to you know, really give the applicant what they're asking for, um, for their business, for their nonprofit, for their mission uh, to, to occupy this house uh, so that they can serve, serve their clients. Um, so I support the report. It's been a while since I signed it, but uh, I still report, uh, support it, and I would ask for your support as well. Thank you, Alderman Mulliner. I would uh, echo what has been said. Uh, I think uh, both of the two aldermen have both expressed the issues that we kind of addressed as we move through this as they relate to what the council is all about. Uh, but I think there's also another piece that the council is all about, and that's humanity. Um, and it's one of the things that I look at when I look at a case, and I will tell you that um, I know a lot of the people who are involved with this case, both who live on the block and some of the people who actually I know Jay, um, and I will tell you that I know what his reputation is, I know what he's gone through in his life, and I know what he's striving to do. I know what he's trying to do to help a community. I would echo what Chairman Honquist said about the fact that you try to run a non-for-profit, you're trying to cross all the T's and dot all the I's, and there's all these legal things that you have to do. But that's not what his mission is. His mission isn't to make sure that every legal thing is crossed. His mission is to help people to stay sober. We all have family members. We all have friends who have gone through issues. And I think there is a point when all of us need to take that step back and say, if not here, where? So I look at it that, you know, I talked with my wife. I said, you know what, what would you do? And her response was, you could put that house next to my house. I'd take it in a heartbeat because I know that we need to help these people. And I would take it next to my house in a heartbeat because I know we need to help these people. There's a lot of people out there who need our support and we need to show that we're human and we're out there to support these people and help them out. And I would support this report wholeheartedly and I hope everybody on the council supports this report. Thank you very much. Alderman Hill. Um, yeah, I, unfortunately this home is uh, saddled with an unfortunate legacy and I, I, I do believe that with proper prior code enforcement and a good history of stewardship, it's quite possible that this group home variance um, for seven individuals would not have been a point of contention for the neighborhood. And if this variance were to be approved, I can easily imagine a scenario where there's a lingering 
possibly antagonistic situation within the neighborhood. And community integration is fundamental to the concept of a group home as defined by ADA and subsequent leg legislation, e.g. the uh, Supreme Court's 1999 Olmstead Act. I feel that this integration would be aided by a local community advisory group comprised of residents from Large Street, members of the group home, and a uh, city effect elected official at large, of which I am willing to serve. Um, the group could meet quarterly or biannually or at the group's initiative, and they would partially serve as a mechanism by which community members could hopefully develop dialogue, rapport, and maybe provide an avenue for negotiation, understanding, and conciliation. Um, in regards to what I've heard mentioned elsewhere, the financial need of the sober home to have more than four applicants, the, the variance application doesn't specifically mention finances. It only states that the home is seeking a variance, operating a group home with more than four unrelated residents. Um, <clears throat> however, I would like to note for the record that in my review of the literature on the subject, uh, I found a 2010 scholarly article that looked at 49 sober living homes in the state of California and um, their rental costs per occupant. And in the study, slightly less than half of these 49 homes charged under $600 a month per resident, which is considerably less than the cost of the home before us tonight. So that's just something that I would like to mention, to keep in mind as we think about finances and costs and you know, what's, what's an amount that, that's out there that uh, residents are expected to pay elsewhere in California, for instance, a competitive expensive market, certainly. So, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Alderman Deuter. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate, um, in particular, the introduction by the chairman that was very informative and, and um, very thorough, and I appreciate it. Um, as we've heard, this is a complex situation and one that's complicated by the home's unique and at times problematic history. I greatly appreciate the robust public participation we heard from residents on both sides of the issue. The comments that we heard were constructive and well-informed. I'm also grateful for the input that the council received last week from Brian Connolly, the attorney that was brought in to provide the training and answer some questions. Many of us put a fair amount of time and energy into researching the relevant issues, many of which were raised by the residents. <clears throat> but the issues involved in this case are not simple ones. And the presentation we heard last week and his insights provided important clarity. And I hope that information was also useful to the public. My thoughts on this case evolved based on the available information. And my thinking is focused on a few points that I just want to mention tonight. Um, some of these you've heard before. The R2 zone allows a group home of up to eight people as a conditional use and does not limit the number of family members in a home. We heard last week from Brian Connolly that a key consideration when we are thinking about a requested accommodation is land use impact. He specifically mentioned traffic, aesthetics, odor, dust, noise. I don't believe that we can make a strong case that the land use impact of seven people in this house is significantly different than the impact of four unrelated adults or the impact of a large family. And the last point that I want to make tonight is indirectly related to this case and focuses on what I believe are two of the city's key responsibilities going forward. One is establishing an alternate process to review requests for accommodation and the second is establishing and maintaining an adequate and effective code enforcement process. So I hope these are two issues that will be quickly addressed by the city and by our council going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Deuter. Alderman Brennan. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> so my prepared remarks are out the window because uh, all the points have been made. So well done on that front. Um, I've been on both sides of this report. Um, and really appreciate the extra time uh, for the council to consider all the uh, uh, information that was uh, before us. Um, and I came to the conclusion I was predominantly um, against the report originally, not, not because of the sober home, but it was predominantly because of the behavior of the homeowner. 
And and so, you know, I'm one that I'm I typically don't like to reward bad behavior. I think it's a bad precedent. That said, you know, with, with all the information that that was reviewed, you know, I flipped back and forth. And quite honestly, you know, I come back to foundational points such as, you know, the uh, Fair Housing Act, American Disability Act. Th these are laws that we have to abide by. Um, I, I definitely believe that Elmhurst should be a, a law-abiding community. I also would like to believe that Elmhurst is an inclusive community. And there is a need for a home like 348 North Larch. So, you know, I, I, what, another point that got me to supporting this report tonight was I do have a lot of confidence in our, our city attorneys. Um, I think they've weighed in on this. They've looked at this in a very thoughtful way. There's no, no one better to, to understand you know, the complicated laws in, in our nation, FHA and ADA being quite complicated. So I'm not gonna sit here, I'm not an attorney. I'm not gonna sit here and, and try to interpret that, but listen to all sides and, and you know, take, take uh, guidance. Uh, when we had the um, uh, Committee of the Whole, uh, Brian Conley w was mentioned, um, the information from that meeting was invaluable to me. Um, it was very consistent with the guidance that we've gotten from our, our city attorneys. And for those reasons, I, I am in support of the report tonight. Um, it wasn't an easy decision, but uh, you know, that is my rationale. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Alderman Polumsky. Thank you, Mayor. Um, like Alderman Brennan, I don't need to tap into any prepared comments. Everybody address them. I really appreciate Alderman Hanquist's introduction and walking through all the components and um, the thought behind um, this decision <clears throat> and the recommendation. Um, I would, I want to touch a little bit on what Alderman Deuter said about another process. I agree. I, I think there are multiple ways in which this could be handled in the future. But I also would argue that just as a university's board of directors or regions are not involved in a specific accommodation to like a course substitution, perhaps subjecting requests like this to um, multiple elected and or appointed officials may um, put an applicant through some unnecessary scrutiny depending on the situation. So I think that's something we need to think about in the future about how we address um, future um, fair housing access requests. Um, and especially one of the one piece I don't think I've heard addressed or read in any of the documents was um, how can the city um, defend for unrelated adults living together. I understand there are old laws based on shenanigans of um, operations when there were four or more unrelated adults, but realistically, it's pretty hard to say that we would deviate from a fundamental um, process or a fundamental um, foundation for housing to say that four unrelated people can live together but five can't. It's really hard to explain why one could be acceptable and one isn't. So I feel like that's one piece we haven't really just dug into, but there are a number of issues that have been raised. Um, I really appreciate the work of the committee um, commission staff and um, the involvement of the residents and the you know advocacy and um, at least I know we have raised awareness of um, the need for individuals individuals in recovery to be part of our community and I also I do want to acknowledge I don't think any of the residents who have come forward um, not in support of this application have been um, against individuals in recovery or it's really truly has been pointed out by multiple people the history of this property and the past experiences that I think have um, you know been driving people's concerns I support this report and again I appreciate everybody's work on it thank you thank you 
Alderman Park. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my hesitancy in supporting this uh, permit is, well, and first off, I support everything everybody does to try to help one another, make connection, you know, move forward. Um, you know, the mission, I think, is wonderful, you know, because everybody wants to have someone else give them a helping hand. Um, but based on the behavior of the homeowner who has not acted in good faith and continues not to in recent years going through this process, um, I am not confident that the first three conditions will be something that will um, be able to you know, be a condition because I don't see right now that there's any sort of uh, oversight mechanism um, you know, and the structure of the policy when, or any uh, transgressions of house rules are made. Um, and I feel fearful that if we move forward with as is, that it would not provide the support, the, the, there was not enough structure to provide uh, support and safety to, for the program to succeed. And I would hate to see it not succeed because of there not being ownership of these, um, you know, different key pieces to make sure that it would be successful. I l really appreciate uh, Alderman Hill's idea about trying to um, make some new relationships between um, everybody involved. And maybe if people are talking more, then there are less chance of there being communication breakdowns or backstories being made up or there they go again or, or anything like that. Um, because I think the, the residents and the people who are in the ministry are on the same page. I think the outlier that has thrown a wrench in things has been the owner. And um, I do appreciate that maybe there would be something about best practices and standards of operations also noted. Um, you know, there's been a lot to learn in this process. Uh, and I'm also confused about the legal ease because I specifically wrote down and heard um, Brian Connolly say last week that sober living homes are subject to the same building code limitations on occupancy as any other use and may be subject to further size limits by local codes. And that local government does have authority to limit on-street and on-site parking, um, ability to uh, inspect for maintenance, uh, and I don't know how to develop that with this report. So that's all. Thank you, Alderman Park. Anybody else? All right. I see no other comment coming forward or request to speak. I'll ask Clerk Tamer to please call the roll. Mulliner? Aye. Brennan? Aye. Grimas? Aye. Deuter? Aye. Dunn? Aye. Hill? Aye. Halumski? Aye. Jensen? Aye. Toludo? Aye. Cahill? Aye. Sorry. Park? No. Conquest? Aye. Bastido's absent. 11 ayes, 1 nay, 1 absent. 11 ayes, 1 nay, 1 absent. Uh, the uh, report passes. Um, I would, although I don't participate in debate, I would like to acknowledge the council dealing with a very tough issue. I'm very proud of the council um, and how they approach this. I had many calls, probably talked to about 90% of the aldermen, and I was very impressed by how people dug in on this issue to educate themselves. I am also uh, thought the community, I spoke to a number of members of the community, they've been here. I thought it was very productive, and I appreciate that kind of constructive input. Um, I do want to point out that, as many of the aldermen have said, we're not afraid of a lawsuit. We have to be mindful of them, but we undertake an oath that we will follow the law. And I think that's what we are, need to do, and we're doing it here. I am an attorney, and I believe that we are doing what we are required to do. Um, I've talked with Alderman Polumski and Deuter in particular, and some other ones. I'm not sure that conditional use is the right way to go as we go forward. Um, the criteria 
for conditional use don't really apply that much to this kind of request for a reasonable accommodation, so maybe we can take those lessons into the future. Um, it's been a long process. Um, I've only been involved for maybe six months. Um, some have lived it longer. I appreciate the committee's work on this in particular. I hope that the neighbors will come together. I know it's uh, not what you wanted. I hope that uh, Mr. Webb seems like a very approachable and thoughtful person, and Mr. Alderman Hill has offered to volunteer his services, so I hope there'll be some dialogue, and uh, if there are issues, Mr. Webb is, uh, I hope, will be accessible, and Alderman Hill will be if you need him, or maybe Alderman Dunn, too. He's got two, in, two aldermen for every ward. So with that, I thank you all for your time on this issue, uh, and I know people spend a lot of time. Um, we're going to move on to item eight, reports and recommendations of appointed elected officials, 8.1 mayor. I just have two. Uh, the uh, reminder the application process and will not be extended again for fifth ward alderman vacancy is June 30th. Uh, information available on the website. Uh, two is because of the, ins the event, I guess they call it, we had last night with the storm, I would once again remind residents to go to our website and sign up for code red in case there actually is some emergency information. You will be contacted instead of trying to contact somebody else. Um, item 8.2, City Manager Grabowski. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I do have a few items. One, I do want to recap last night's uh, storm for the council. Um, so late uh, last night, we did have uh, quite a storm come through DuPage County, and um, we had a couple events that we were watching. Uh, fortunately for Elmhurst, uh, the storm kind of split around us, and uh, citywide, we fared uh, pretty well. Uh, we did have the um, Palmer Drive underpass uh, fill with some storm water and portions of the Route 83 underpass uh, as well. Uh, but it drained down fairly quickly and we got it cleaned up uh, to make it passable. We had three calls for street flooding um, isolated from that. So uh, all in all, I'd say pretty good. Uh, the rain amounts varied though. Uh, I was talking with uh, the Public Works Director earlier today and uh, we, we got anywhere from 0.7 inches on the south end of town to two inches on the north side of town. And uh, some gauges had 1.36 in between. Um, so hard to believe because it, it sure seemed like it was coming down in buckets on the south side where I was. Um, and then uh, we all, outside of the rain, uh, we also had a couple of tornado watches that happened and warnings. Uh, we had an unconfirmed one in Addison uh, about 1045. And because of that, I was talking with uh, uh, Mr. Anishevitz uh, as we were going through the storm. Um, he was paying attention to all that. So at 1042, we activated the sirens, the tornado sirens. So everybody knows three minutes before, at least, we, uh, there was an um, unconfirmed tornado in Addison. And then at approximately 1110, uh, there was uh, a tornado that touched down in the Woodridge, Darien, Naperville area. Uh, so it was two different locations we were keeping an eye on. And just so people know, we have six sirens in town, uh, and they all go off at the same time. Uh, DUCOM activates them upon a call from either the police chief or the fire chief. And uh, they are located at the fire training tower in the north end of town, at Barron's Park, at Field School, at York High School, at Jefferson School and at Jackson School. So six locations throughout town, and they are tested. First Tuesday of every month, 10 o'clock, uh, they go off. Um, so uh, we did fare well, as I said. Um, unfortunately, some of our neighbors to the west did not. We did send two police officers out, the, out to Woodridge last night upon their request to help with some patrols. And uh, we also offered up uh, some public works uh, chipper crews today, but uh, Woodridge had what they needed, at least for today. We'll keep them in mind, though, as the uh, mutual aid for public works calls go out this week. Anything we can do. I've reached out to the managers there. So anything that you need, let us know. Uh, we're happy to do that. So I do want to thank everybody who was on uh, shift last night. I know that uh, when something like this happens, we have um, patrol officers go to kind of the eastern side of the community and keep an eye out. They're trained weather spotters so that they can see if there's any uh, funnel clouds forming or anything like that. If you have any further questions, please let me know. I'm happy to answer those. 
a couple more items. Uh, definitely some good news. Uh, we were recently notified that the stormwater project at um, um, on Swain Avenue uh, has received the APWA Chicago Metro Chapter um, Project of the Year for Environment less than $5 million. Uh, so that's the Sailor Swain Vallette uh, Stormwater Improvement Project. So congratulations to uh, the Public Works Department. Congratulations to the City Council for approving that and funding that. It's a great project. And as we know from last night, our projects work and it's a good thing they're in place. Uh, next, we, uh, we are in the process of working on the um, bike bridge, uh, pedestrian bridge over Route 83 on the north end of town. And as everybody knows, we put in for some grants a couple years ago and did get some uh, significant funding for it. We continue to apply for grants. And most recently, we put in for an ITEP grant for the design, the phase two design. And we put in for a grant of $176,000. We were just recently awarded that uh, money. And IDOT is, is including an extra 22000 which will cover half of the 20% match. So then the city will be um, on the hook for another 22000 So we got $198,000 in grants for the Phase two design of that. Once that's done, we are continuing to apply for federal grants to try to get the remainder of the construction um, funded. And last, but not certainly not least, the Neighborhood Roll Call Program continues. This week, Tuesday, tomorrow at 7 o'clock, uh, Neighborhood Roll Call will take place at Jackson and Sailor. And on Thursday, it will be at Crescent and Arlington. So please come on out. They've been very well attended and very well received, of course. And uh, it's fun to see all the neighbors out there. That's what I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. That's a lot. Thank you, City Manager. On to illusory item 8.3, so I remember to ask if anyone else has reports, any other elected officials. Alderman Moliner. I just want to make one comment about last night's storm. It's just kind of a reminder to the public, if you've got any grates in your front yard or in your parkway or on the, on the streets, would you please uh, take a couple of minutes, walk out there and clean those out? That helps us prevent the flooding in the streets and on the prop, on the <laughs> parkways. Uh, it's helpful. We don't have enough crews for us to actually go out and clean up every single one of them. So if you can each take a little bit of responsibility, it helps out a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. Any other reports? Item nine, other business. Is there any other business to be brought before the council? Seeing none, item 10, adjourn. I'll take a motion to adjourn. Alderman Brennan, second Alderman Hanquist. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you.